The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Well, good morning and welcome to Oxford United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Caleb. We are so glad that you've joined us for worship today. And if you're a visitor with us this morning, we want to especially welcome you here to Oxford United Methodist Church. And as we get into our service, we always have a couple of announcements to bring to your attention. Number one, we say this every week, but if you would take some time during the service to fill out that yellow card that's inside your bulletin, we would greatly appreciate that. On one side is where you fill in your information so we can connect with you. But on the back side are for prayer concerns. If you have any prayer concerns, feel free to put them there, and our prayer team would be glad to pray over those during the week. And you can take those yellow cards along with any tithes and offerings that you might have with you this morning and place them in the baskets at the conclusion of today's service. And speaking of the conclusion of today's service, at 11.30... That's generally when we get out of here if I don't preach too long. We uh, will have a going deeper session, the next in our going deeper sessions, uh, down in the fellowship hall. Uh, this one is on racism and the church, uh, our going deeper series, if you don't know anything about them. They're a time where I get to teach on a given subject and go a little bit deeper with you than I generally do when I go into our sermons on Sunday mornings. This allows us to focus a little bit more intentionally on a given subject. And the subject that we'll be focusing on today is racism and the church. Um, if you don't have a lunch and want to go get it quickly, you can do that, or you can just join us. It usually only takes about an hour for these sessions uh, to take place. Um, but if you brought your lunch, you're all ready to go. Um, and our college students, um, you are invited to join us, and we will have lunch provided for you as well today. Well, for our next announcement, I'm going to actually invite Miss Sadie to come forward uh, because there's something exciting that our youth are doing this summer. At the OUMC Youth, last year we went on a mission trip to Frakes, Kentucky, and we're excited to return this year, and we loved our trip last year. And we had an opportunity to side a shed, build a ramp, and form new con connections with locals each other and Christ. In order to return, we need fundraising help to cover transportation, housing, meals, and materials for the projects. If you are interested and able to support, you can find a donation tree outside of the fellowship hall after service. And the tree has envelopes labeled one through 50, and the number of each envelope corresponds with the amount of money you can donate inside. So if you pick up a number 25 envelope, you put $20, $25 inside. And there's also a line of envelopes marked other so if you want to donate a different amount that's on the tree or if the amount on the tree is already taken that you wanted to donate, you can put it in that little other envelope. Thank you for your support, whether it's financial or through prayer, and we look forward to updating you about our trip. Well, that is all of our announcements for you this morning. Would you please rise in body or in spirit as Sue comes forward to lead us in our call to worship? Sing a new song to the Lord, who has worked wonders, whose right hand and holy arm have brought salvation. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Sing psalms to the Lord with the harp, with the sound of music.
as you remain in your posture of worship this morning, would you join with me in our scriptural confession of faith, which is printed in your bulletin? This is the good news that we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. You may be seated. Good morning. I feel like we're looking thin today. I feel like we have less people than usual. I don't know. Maybe everyone's tired today. I'm tired today. Very tired today. But here we are. We're here. I'm so glad that you're all here. I'm glad I've got some kiddos to keep me awake. I'm excited about that. They always, you know, get my spirits up. They really get me going on a Sunday morning, I'll tell you what. I never leave here tired. I always leave here energized from all of them. So we are talking about the fruit of the Spirit. My voice is finally back, which means I can finally start speaking to all of you again, which means you all have to listen to me again. But we are talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Now, when you think of fruit, you probably think of apples, maybe some grapes, maybe an orange. Maybe a tomato, there's that whole argument about tomatoes a fruit and that whole thing, you know. Avocado is a fruit, I found that out recently. I'm not so sure how I feel about that. There are times where I realize myself, I'm like, this has been a rough week for me. I haven't been eating well. I've had a lot of french fries, you know, a lot of chicken nuggets. And then I think to myself, I need an apple immediately, right now, or a carrot, or something, something that's good for me, something nutritional, something with value that's going to be good in my system. Something that grows outside, not something that's made in an air fryer. Maybe you've heard the saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. I truly believe that to be true. I truly think that if I eat more apples, I'll never have to go to the doctor. Let me let you in on a secret, that's not the truth. But we're talking about a different kind of fruit, the fruit of the spirit. Now, what does that mean? And you think about that. Well, I started thinking about that and I said to myself, you know what, I can make this fun. So going forward, each week, we're going to do a different one of the fruits of the spirit. Patience, kind, love, joy. You all know the whole spiel. But each one is going to represent a fruit. So stay tuned because that should be fun. Now, just as I was talking about how you get something from fruit, like from an orange, you get vitamin C. Maybe an apple keeps you away from the doctor a little longer than some other people. They talk about carrots giving you eyesight. I know that's a vegetable, but that still falls in the same category, I think, of something good in your system, something to help you. Even if it's a myth, you know, I'm still going to live by it. But they don't talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now that fruit of the Spirit, that's pretty cool. The Spirit grows inside you like that apple on a tree. You walk around and you see an apple tree, you'd expect to probably see apples. You see a pear tree, you'd probably expect to see some pears. You see someone filled with the Holy Spirit, what would you expect to see? You might not know. We may know, but the people outside these walls may not know what they should expect to see. We should expect to see patience, gentleness, kindness, love, joy. But let me tell you, I'm not patient all the time. I don't know about you guys, but I I do lose my patience from time to time. I'm not loving all the time, I try to be, but we can't, we can't be perfect all the time, you know. Not everything is joyful. But one thing I do know 
Because in those moments where I feel most filled with the Holy Spirit, I feel like I'm just radiating all of those things. Patience and kindness and love, self-control, joy. I see a person in this church, they ask me, how are you? And I know they mean it. They really want to know. It's that extra stroke of kindness. I sat in on Sunday school last week with Miss Madeline, and she was talking about educating people on faith without being over the top and pushy. And I really liked that because I don't think there's enough education out there. I don't think enough people know what's going on in here. And I think that's because of this stereotype or this stigma towards Christianity in some ways. But you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and show it in so many ways. Just by being kind. You might walk up to someone and just ask them how their day is going and really mean it. Don't just ask them because you feel like you should. You know, like when you see someone in the hallway and you're like, how are you? And you keep walking. When people do that, I'm always confused because I'm like, well, you asked me, but you walked away. But we've all done that before. But really taking that moment to mean it. Really taking that moment to be fruitful, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see apples grow on trees, grapes grow on vines. We don't all grow in the same way, just like fruit doesn't grow in the same way. Everyone grows in their faith differently. Everyone chooses their path with Christ. No two apples look the same. No two bananas look exactly the same. We are supposed to be flawed. Some apples are bruised. Some fall on the ground. Just like us, sometimes we're bruised or we fall down and get back up again. But if we can be fruitful and filled with the Holy Spirit, those things, that patience, that kindness, that joy that can grow inside us, and we can show that to everyone around us, and I think that's so cool. And I'm so excited to be able to talk about each one of those each of the next few weeks. So today I'll just leave you with, Think about your growth, your journey, your faith. Make it your own. You're your own unique, whatever you want to be, whatever fruit you want to be. If you want to be a vegetable, that's fine too. You could be whoever you want to be, wherever you want to be. But just be filled with the Holy Spirit and let him do the work in you so that you can produce his fruit. All right, Pastor Caleb's going to go ahead and pray for us. All right, before our children go off to Children's Church, would you join with me in praying over them? The way we do that here is we just simply hold out our hands as we pray over them. Lord God, we give you thanks for your children and the opportunity that they have today to learn more about your spirit, which is alive in each one of us, your Holy Spirit, which allows us to grow in our faith and to do that through the fruit of the spirit, which you have provided for us generously. And so, Lord, help our children today learn more and grow more as they study your word together. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer, let us be thoughtful of those on our hearts that need the extra touch. And let us also, if you would like, to come forward and light a candle in care or concern or in celebration of your relationship with Jesus. We open the candles to you now. Thank you.
Let us come to a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning as we gather, we celebrate being in community together, watching over and caring for one another. Many prayers are being lifted, and we praise you for working in those lives today. Teach us to reflect your love in all that we do, to offer kindness, to offer support to all of those around us, and to appreciate the beauty of your creation that surrounds us. As April continues to unfold, showing more and more signs of spring and renewal, we ask your guidance to rejuvenate our spirits and strengthen our faith. Help us to embrace the premise of new beginnings and the joy of the resurrection with open hearts. And we come now, as Jesus taught this prayer to his disciples, let us join in those words together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. The scripture for today comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 96. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad. Let the heavens and the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing of joy before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. The word of God for the people of God. All it takes is a little bit of misunderstanding in order for controversy to break out. 
think about it, a lot of controversies, I mean, a lot of things are just by nature controversial, but certain things people mistake for controversies because they don't exactly understand it very well. And so misunderstanding is like the flint that sparks controversy in our world. And this happened a couple years ago to a woman named Marie Kondo. Now, Marie Kondo, she wrote a book called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. And yes, I read it. It's a very real good book on how to tidy up or how to organize your life and get rid of the things that you don't need and keep the things that you, you do need. And she developed this message, or this method rather, called the KonMari Method. But controversy sparked when somebody took one of her quotes out of context and they were just jokingly doing it on Twitter. They were just making a tweet out of it, making fun of that. They didn't mean anything bad by it. But guess what? Other people came along. They didn't know the context and they misappropriated it and it caused a controversy because what she said was simply this. Ideally, you should only have 30 books. Now, if you know me, I was insulted hearing this at first, because it's like, if you've been in my office, you know I have more than 30 books. And this was just a misunderstanding. She's not saying you should only have 30 books, regardless of who you are. And I know for a lot of us book lovers out there, this is a very insulting thing to say to us, because we get really sen sensitive about our books, and we're sentimental about them. We want to keep them around. And she was just saying, you know what? If you really need to, to get through your house and the books are causing you to trip over them, and you don't even know how the books got there in the first place, maybe you should get rid of them and aim for 30. But if you like books, keep all 3,000 of them. You don't need to get rid of them. Keep them there. That's all she was saying. But yes, somebody took it out of context and thought that this woman was saying you need to get rid of all your books. But one of the key things about the KonMari method that she had and that she had developed, and it's a good method, by the way, is she asks you to simply can look at every single item you own and ask, does this bring me joy? It's a good way of sorting through your clothing closet in spring. Does this bring me joy? Do I still need to have this around? I haven't worn it in 30 years. Does this still bring me joy? And there's certain things, yes, that do. But this question, what brings you joy is an essential one of, of who we are, not just as Christians, but who we are as humans. And we are on the subject of joy today because we are going through the fruit of the Spirit. Last week, we kicked off our sermon series here on the fruit of the Spirit, the nine fruit of the Spirit, and we talked about love. We talked about how love is this holy gift. It's, it's given to us, so it's meant to be enjoyed and shared but it's also holy and that it's something that we take care of and respect. And it's our duty, First John reminds us, to share love with other people. That if we say we love God and we don't love our neighbor, then we are liars. Because love is meant to be shared. And what keeps us from love? Well, First John says, fear. But guess what? Perfect love, God's holy love, casts out fear. I like what Marilyn Matt Robinson, the author, has to say. She reminds us that fear is not a Christian habit of mind. Because guess what? I looked at the fruit of the Spirit this morning, and there's no fear in that list. No, we're not meant to to live with fear. It's not a Christian habit of mind. Now, that's a good quote. And speaking of good quotes, last week uh, when I introduced uh, love, I gave you the top 10 quotes that I went and found online. Just randomly searched and found quotes for you. And so I'm just going to turn this into a thing where every week I give you my top 10 quotes. It's kind of turning into a David Letterman thing. I know some of the young people you're looking at me this morning the way I looked when people would mention Johnny Carson. So I'm with you this morning because some people just don't know who that is or don't think that he's all that relevant. But at any rate, these are the top 10 quotes and I, 
usually I don't like have an order to them. It's just random. Um, but I will say I'm saving the best for last. So I'll just say that this morning. Also, before I put these up here, I know some of you were busily writing these down. Just take out your camera on your phone and take a picture of it. Like, it's okay. I'm not going to judge you for doing that this morning. But our first quote comes from Mother Teresa. She said that joy is a net of love by which you catch souls. And then from Jim Ron, the walls we build around us to keep sadness out also keeps out the joy. That's basically the plot to the movie Inside Out, by the way. From Marianne Williamson, joy is what happens to us when we allow ourselves to recognize how good things really are. From John Wooden, well, your greatest joy definitely comes from doing something for another, especially when it was done with no thought of something in return. From Amelia Barr, it is only in sorrow bad weather masters us. In joy, we face the storm and defy it. And then from Richard Wagner, joy is not in things, it is in us. Charles, Dixon, Charles Dickens wrote, the pain of parting is nothing to the joy of meeting again. From Michel de Montaigne, the most profound joy has more of gravity than of gaiety in it. And then I had to do this one because it was online, by the way, as one of the top quotes for joy. But joy to the world, the Lord is come, let earth receive her king. And then I said I was going to share the best one for last, and it's pretty obvious why it's my favorite one. Joy is the simplest form of gratitude, thus saith Karl Barth. See, we can see that just like love, joy is a word worthy of reflection and commendation. It's, there's something about joy that is distinctly and yet not exclusively human. It's difficult for us to think of life, in other words, without joy. Like we need joy in life to really experience the goodness of life, especially as God has designed it for us. And so it's obvious then why joy would show up in the fruit of the Spirit. I've been reminding people every week with this that the fruit of the Spirit aren't exhaustive here. Like, this isn't the complete list of the fruit of the Spirit. Wisdom's in there. Gratitude's in there. Acting justly should be in there as well. That's not the point that Paul is trying to convey with the fruit of the Spirit, that this is the total picture. There's just nine fruit of the Spirit. He's just mentioning these nine for a reason. The nine actually form three sets of three. The first set is love, joy, and peace. The second set is patience, kindness, generosity. And then the last set is faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We're meant to see all of those in their groupings. And the order here is instructive by way of contrast to what these fruit are defined against. See, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul is describing two ways of life. There's the way of the Spirit, which he's commending the people to live, and there's the way of the flesh, which he wants them to avoid. And the reason he wants them to avoid this way of life is because that way of life is no way of life at all. It's the way of death. It's the way of chaos and violence. That's what the way of the flesh is like. He describes it beginning in verse 16. I'm going backwards here this morning. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, fashions, uh, factions, envy, drunkenness, corrosing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, when you look at that list, there's no structure there. I mean, he kind of admits as much when he says just things like these as well. He's saying this way of life is unbalanced and chaotic and turbulent 
And God desires a different way of life, a life that is strengthened and bolstered by things like love, peace, and joy. Now, this does not mean, however, that life isn't sometimes crazy or unfair. The fruit of the Spirit don't make you immune to life's difficulties, but they do help you endure them and to get through them. You can't control the chaotic world around you, but you can keep that chaos in its place by cultivating the fruit of the Spirit and living with things like love and things like joy. And that's exactly what joy is meant to do, is to help us move through life. And I will say this, if you want to begin with joy, you've got to make sure you begin in the right place. And when it comes to us, when we think of joy, we have to begin in one place. And that is with God. Because from there, that's where all of our joy should come from. We begin our journey today by focusing on who God is and the joy that God has brought to all of us. And the number one reason I think that we deprive ourselves and others of joy is with our image of God. That is, if your image of God is one in which God essentially has his arms crossed, as opposed to a God whose arms are open to you, you live out of that image, whatever it is. And a lot of people, their fundamental image of God is the first one, that God is just fundamentally there sitting in heaven with God's arms crossed, ready to punish us for any little mistake that we make, that God has it out for us. And we have to do something to impress that God enough so that that God might open God's arms. But I want to suggest to you this morning that God is already open to us. God already says yes to us. See, God doesn't first say no and then wait for us to do something in order to provide a yes. No, it's rather this. God begins with yes and then provides the no only when things try to keep us from the reality of that yes. So God fundamentally wants us to experience God's love, but God will say no to those things that keep us from that love or distort that love or harm other people. Friends, this morning what I'm trying to say to you is that just like some people have lactose intolerance, which, you know, makes it difficult for them to consume dairy products, we need to develop an intolerance for any image of God that is fundamentally joyless. That doesn't lead us to want to worship God for what God has done for us. See, you will foreclose every opportunity for joy in your life if you misunderstand who God is. If you don't know the story of our salvation, if you don't know the powerful reality of the Spirit's work and presence in our lives. See, from the beginning, we know that God was for us and that Christ died and rose again for us. And that the Holy Spirit is with us and works for us. See, there's joy in this knowledge. It's not just good information. It's good news. See, a lot of people think that when the women discovered that the tomb was empty first, that they just spread the news out of fear. And that may have been true in the beginning, but eventually the reality and truth of what God did for them sparked joy, such that joy was bringing that message, not fear. Now, I know fear spreads fast, but joy spreads deeply and transformatively. And that's the power of what they preached. They got the joy from knowing what God did for them, and they spread it. That's why I'm saying this morning, if you want to begin on the journey of joy, you have to begin with who God is and what God has done for you. But the next step in that journey, and most people want to skip over this part, 
because this is challenging, is that you have to learn to take joy in yourself. This is a challenging thing. This is a challenging word for us to hear because we are often told that, you know what, too much joy in yourself, you're prideful or narcissistic or too little joy in yourself is proof that there's something wrong with you. And so no wonder we mess up when it comes to joy. We don't know how to receive it for ourselves. We, not, we don't know how to even celebrate ourselves and the joy of life that God has given us. And so we can come to experience joy in ourselves when we practice self-love. And I know people get nervous when they hear about self and love coming together because we're taught, I don't know by whom, but almost instinctively from the moment we're born that we shouldn't really love ourselves too much because to love ourselves too much is a bad thing. And by doing so, we keep ourselves from joy. See, we often make joy a difficult thing when we neglect taking joy in ourselves. And like I said, it's like we get this message early on. Maybe some people are teaching it outright, but I think we just instinctively pick up on it. It's a signal that we pick up on that we can't really love ourselves. I remember when I was young, I was a kid, I was at a festival. I don't even know what the festival was, but we were walking through this parking lot and there was a lot of people moving around and, and moving through the cars as they were trying to get to where they were going. And I noticed this little girl that was walking and she stopped at the side of one of the cars and I don't think anybody else saw her. I know I saw her, but she stopped at the side of a car and she looked in the side mirror. I thought she was just looking at her hair or something like that to see or whatever. Um, but she looked in the mirror and she said these words and I'll never forget them. She said, I hate you. You're ugly. I was a child at the time, and my heart broke in that moment. It still breaks. And I hope she discovered that her words were untrue. But I give this story to you today to just say that for some reason we pick up on this message early on that self-love is a bad thing. But what I'm saying today is we can't really experience joy if we don't learn the art of self-love. Because when you learn to take joy in yourself, you're practicing the art of self-love. This isn't a selfish, a selfish thing. It's not a deceptive thing either. Because joy results from learning to love yourself without deception or pretense. What I'm saying is to love your true self is not a bad thing. And it never is a bad thing. In fact, I would say to love your true self, as scary as it can be, is the, one of the best things that you can do. Self-love shouldn't be a scary thing, something to avoid. Otherwise, we might risk becoming narcissistic. See, self-love is acknowledging a deeper truth that we just learned about God, that God is for us. And God made us. And so that means that God is for you as you. But here's the thing. We come up with fake versions of ourselves or, or we try to be something that we're not or we try to be someone that God didn't make us to be. And so it's like, let's say these two cups this morning. I just grabbed these two cups this morning. Let's say this is the real you, who you really are. But let's say this cup is who you pretend to be or who others want you to be. If you spend time drinking from this cup or filling this cup up with water, you will never drink from this cup because it's not you. You can pour as much water as you want into it until it's overflowing. But because it's not you, you'll never drink from it. And guess what? The real you will always be an empty cup. And so it makes sense that we would want to fill the real versions of ourselves with joy and with love. There's nothing wrong with taking joy in ourselves. And I say this step right after 
taking joy in God because I believe it to be a necessary step to the next part of our journey in joy. And that is learning to take joy in other people. This is where I sometimes think, at least for myself, it's easier to take joy in others more than in myself. But to get to those others, I need to experience joy for myself and celebrate that joy. See, we know that joy, it comes from family, from our marriage, from our friends. It can come from our colleagues, believe it or not. It can come from our church community. Being with people can bring us joy. I know it can be challenging sometimes, but it can bring us joy. And joy of others is made possible by learning to see them as God does or celebrating them in all that they are and their uniqueness, the real them. But also about creating opportunities or experiences for the joy of being together to happen. I mean, think about it. When we have people over at our house for dinner We want that to be a joyous occasion, don't we? I mean, unless you're in the business of just setting up dinners to be the most joyless thing in the world. Like, what are you doing with them? You want something good to come out of it. And joy of others consists in taking joy in them and receiving joy from them as well. But we need to understand this important truth about joy. Because joy is a fruit of the Spirit, if you don't share it, it will rot. That's what makes the fruit of the Spirit so transformative, is that when we share it, it increases. And it grows. And it changes lives. But when we don't share it, and we deprive others of it, We deny it for ourselves as well. That's what I mean when I say it will rot. But friends, the journey of joy doesn't even end there. See, Psalm 96 allows us to see that joy is actually comprehensive of all life. Because what does it say near the end of that psalm about the trees of the forest? But even they shout for joy. Friends, if trees were designed for joy then you surely were too. All of us were designed to live with joy. This is how I think you know you have experienced the power of joy when you can learn to see it all around you. And perhaps that's the greatest challenge, right? Because, yeah, joy opens us to the world around us. But despite that, sometimes all we see are the things that bring us disappointment or grief or despair. It's like we don't have any eyes to see all the joyous things that are happening around us at every given moment. But here's the good news when it comes to joy. Joy can take root in any soil. Whether it is an open field or a crack in the sidewalk, joy will grow there. Because all joy needs is the soil of your heart in order for it to grow. But even though joy can grow and take root in any soil, it must be tended to. It must be cultivated. See, we think of life as this complex thing and joy as this simple thing. Maybe a lot of us think, you know what? I had joy when I was a kid. But now that I pay taxes, it flew out the window somewhere on I-71. Somewhere. I don't know. But I got good news. Joy can take root in any soil. That's what makes it the fruit of the Spirit. It comes from God. And every single moment is an opportunity for joy. And just like last week, I gave you two warnings about love. I'll I'll end today with two warnings about joy. The first warning is simply this. Joy cannot be forced. So for some of you, you've got to let yourself off the hook this morning. But I will also say this. Joy cannot be forced, 
but it must be cultivated. That if you have it, cultivate it. Allow it to grow in you. And that leads to the second one, the second warning. Don't hesitate. When joy is before you, don't pick off little pieces of it and think, ah, oh, if I indulge too much in this joy, I'm going to be insensitive to everybody around me. That's not the way that joy works. It's not the way it's supposed to, to, to work in our lives. See, Mary Oliver wrote this poem, and I, I've quoted it many times, or at least parts of it. And she begins by saying, if you suddenly and unexpectedly feel joy, don't hesitate. Give in to it. And her final line is simply this. Joy is not made to be a crumb. Friends, you can't live off of crumbs. You're not meant to live off of crumbs. You're meant to live off of what God has given you. The bread of life is given to you. And just like we wouldn't take little bits of what life Jesus has for us, we shouldn't take little bits off of joy, but rather give in to it. Don't hesitate. Friends, even the trees, even those Bradford pear trees, were designed for joy. And if they were designed for joy, you are as well. May you carry within you the good news that joy can take root in any soil, but it must be tended to. Let us pray. Lord God, through your word, you give us powerful reminders of your truth, but you also bring us into your truth through the power of your word to speak new life in us. And Lord, today in Psalm 96, we understand that joy is comprehensive. It's, it's all around us. Even the trees sing joy. And Lord, you have shaped each one of us for a life of joy. That your joy might be rooted in our hearts so that we live with that joy and we share that joy. So Lord, Allow us to celebrate this morning that good word, that joy is with us because of what you have done for us and who you are. Lord, we sing praise to your name because you reign above and you have gifted us with every necessary thing we need to live life. And so with that, Lord, may we embrace joy as that one necessary thing that we need this day to serve you faithfully. Lord, we pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. For our final hymn this morning, we are going to sing praise to God who reigns above, hymn number 126. Let us sing verses 1 and 4 together. Well, friends, I will say that you showed up to the right service today. I went over 10 minutes in the early service. So you guys are good uh, ending early this morning.
Uh, but may you truly understand within your hearts this day that you were designed for a life of joy and through the power of the Holy Spirit, that spirit which is alive in you is producing that fruit of joy this day. May your tongues reflect the good news which has been planted in your hearts. May you sing joy with your life this day. Go now in the one who gives us his love and peace that we might share in his glory. The name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as we go, may we make ourselves an offering to God as we sing our doxology, hymn number 95, together. <laughs> 